Uh, yes, we are adding a W into BIM. So we are moving from BIM to BWIM, which is, stands for Bridgeway in Motion. This will be a very superficial presentation because the topic itself would require much more than 12 minutes, which I think I have. Uh, so I just hope that you will get the flavor uh, what uh, we are trying to achieve with this kind of monitoring. Uh, this is the short outline. So first about the difference between bridge assessment and bridge design. Uh, then what is bridgeway motion? How do we use it uh, to measure bridge performance indicators? And I will uh, finish my talk with some examples and case studies. So why would, do we need optimized bridge assessment? You know that the infrastructure is aging. Uh, and we have more and more cases like the bridge on the top, uh, while on the other hand we have traffic which is growing all the time. Uh, so this is definitely a problem. Uh, fortunately, bridges are stronger than we think, and low defects are less uh, than in the codes. So the bridges are very likely safe. Uh, the problem is how to prove uh, that they are safe. Uh, so basically how we show that the resistance of the bridge is higher than the load effects. Uh, I will not talk about bridge capacity. I will just point out the problem of, about the older, or the old bridge stock. This is an example of Slovenia. We have 2,500 bridges on the national road network. And this is distribution of the age. The problem is that all the codes, and we have used eight since 1904, uh, have different loading schemes included. And only the last two, the one which is based on the Euro code and the one which was based on the former German code, are appropriate for today's loading. So in principle, all those bridges in red and in orange uh, are problematic only because of the age. So if we would have to uh, consider safety based on the age, we would have problems. So we have to do something more. And this is uh, what we call the optimized bridge assessment. Uh, just a reminder, what is the big difference between design and assessment? Uh, you all know, and I assume that there are more designers in this room uh, than assessors of bridges, is that the new bridges shall be designed conservatively, uh, mainly due to all uncertainties uh, about increasing loading and about dec decreasing capacity. So if this is a typical truck which was used when the average bridge in Slovenia was built, and this is something which we see today. This is something which is coming. Uh, it's only a few years away. Not to mention that some countries are using even much heavier trucks. We have a problem. So we have to deal with that. Fortunately, we can do measurements. And uh, because the assessment should be optimal as much as we can, we should not use the design information. We should try to collect the real information. And Lucky for us, capacity and loading can be measured and monitored. And I will try to demonstrate how to do that with WIM, way motion, or bridgeway motion. So what is bridgeway motion? Uh, if we want to know the traffic loading, we have to weigh the traffic. We prob you probably all know traffic counters, but they are useless because they only give you numbers of trucks, they don't give you any, any information about the traffic loading itself. So the, about X loads, about the X spacings, which is needed to convert loads into load effects. So bridgeway motion or BWIM, now you see the difference in one letter, is a measuring system that uses an existing instrumented road or, or rail structure. So this can be a bridge or a shorter culvert to weigh vehicles in motion at normal highway speed. So you have information about the weight, about the axle loads of every vehicle that crosses uh, the measuring point. It's based on strain measurement. Uh, the principles are pretty old, but they were not very successful at the beginning. Uh, so the big progress was done in the 90s when uh, we were involved into two European projects, uh, which resulted in a, what we call now CWIM, wave motion system, uh, which is quite popular now around the world with 2,500 plus installation in 25 plus countries. It's based on strain measurements. So you see the strain sensors here, uh, two typical uh, bridges, beam and, uh, beam and slab or slab uh, bridges. Uh, I said based on strain measurements. 
The advantages are, compared to some other technologies available, that uh, the system is completely portable, so you can detach the entire instrumentation and you move it on another bridge. It's hardly accurate because of the length of the scale compared to some other scales that are built into the pavement. You don't interrupt the traffic, which is a very big issue when you perform measurements on existing structures because everything is underneath, and provide structural information, which is basically the point of my talk. A uh, couple of disadvantages, not always you have a bridge available, and it also requires some knowledge about bridges if we move from these simple structures to something more complex. These are just two extreme cases. Uh, this is a bridge that we did in Canada, so very short, uh, two plus three meter integral structure. On the other hand, the other extreme is the Viaduc de Mio until 2016, the tallest uh, bridge in the world, uh, where we also performed uh, the measurements. So how do we use this data for bridge assessment? Uh, there are actually five parameters that improve structural uh, analysis and can be obtained from uh, these systems. The first one is axle loads, axle spacing, speed, vehicle class, and all this kind of vehicle information that you need. Uh, but this can be obtained also from any other wave motion system. So for those who have sensors built into the pavement, which is the alternative uh, technology. But we can also measure four structural parameters, which we only obtain with bridge wind. The first one are the strain records themselves, because, as I said, the measurement is based on strains. We can measure influence lines, so we're not talking about the theoretical influence lines, but about the true measured influence lines. We can measure distribution of traffic loading over structural members, the so-called uh, girder distribution factor, as it is uh, included in some codes. And we can also measure the dynamic loading. And I will now shortly, in five minutes, explain how this can be done. The first one, and it's probably the key one, is the influence line. In particular, the old bridges behave quite differently to what we think they behave. This is an example uh, of an influence line calculated from 500 influence lines calculated from the random vehicles that cross the bridge. We have included into our bridge wheel system a module which calculates bridge influence line from every vehicle that crosses the structure. This can be then uh, statistically evaluated. You see the average value is the blue line. You have one standard deviation, the, gray, the, the gray lines. So you see that uh, the procedure is quite robust. So influence line is the key for calculating the weights. And this slide will demonstrate how this is done. This is just a measured bridge response from a five axle truck. The first thing we have to do is to measure the, the axle spacings. So we see that this is one, two, two configuration of a truck. And if we know uh, the influence line, then we know that uh, the same strain can be modeled uh, with, uh, by adding together the contributions of uh, influence lines times the X loads. And with the iteration process, we can get back the X loads if we have the correct influence line, which I explained on the slide before. Uh, if we have this and we minimize those two, uh, we can basically get back the X loads. And also, we can uh, subtract the dynamic uh, portion of the signal, which will come in a the next slides. So how does this work in practice? These were measurements that we did in New Jersey in the United States two years ago uh, on a bridge which can't be more simply supported than this. Uh, you, you will agree with that when you see this, this steel hinge. So the influence line uh, should look something like this. In reality, it was something like this. So when you update the model, which is the, the key goal to update the structural model, you can see that in this case the bending moments are approximately 70% only of the theoretical ones. This was a very mild case to say so. In the extreme cases it can go much lower. So in my uh, experience the lowest that we measured was only 44% of the theoretical simply supported uh, bending moments. When we have the axle loads, we have to model uh, the, the load effects uh, for the long-term load effects. So we are interested in the extreme cases. I have no time to go into details. There are a number of procedures how to do that, how to extrapolate the measured uh, load effects into the future. 
uh, into the low uh, time periods that we are interested in. So this is one parameter which is key for the assessment. The important thing to remember is that the results are always lower than the one in the codes. I have never measured anything which was even close uh, to the design loading. And this is important for the existing bridges. For the new ones, thank God we have conservatism in it. But for the, for the old ones, it's, it's very important. The second thing is, or basically the fourth thing actually, is the dynamic response of bridges. If you have ever stood on a bridge uh, when the truck was crossing, it's pretty frightening because the vibration can be really high. So these are some of those examples. Single trucks on the bridge, very high dynamic amplification factor. But if the loading goes up, so this is a heavy seven axle truck, or on the bottom 11 axle special transport, you can see the dynamics is basically vanishing. This can be seen in the next diagram, which uh, compiles the results of the BVU measurements, which again, compiles this dynamic amplification factor for every crossing, every event that happens on the bridge. And you can clearly see with lower strains, these dynamic amplification factors are high, which is what you feel when you have a single track on it. But when it goes to the right, so the, higher ve uh, the heavier vehicles, more vehicles at the same time, dynamics goes down. And you have two uh, comparisons, uh, one of the old uh, Slovene pre-Euro code, bridge design code for this bridge, uh, and you can see how much lower the actual values are. And the last one, you can do similar things with the load distribution factors. You have so many sensors on the bridge that you can evaluate statistically the responses on every measure point, and you get true load distribution, which you can use then in your model calibration. So I will conclude this uh, with uh, uh, some examples. Uh, so if we calculate safety, so if we turn around the limit state formula and uh, we use the rating factor equation, which is quite popular in some codes, this should clearly be more than one. And when we perform measurements, uh, we have real traffic load information, which means that DAF value and live load effects are lower. Uh, also, the dead load effect is lower because we apply the true influence line which all means uh, that the measure of safety, which in this case is the rating factor, uh, will increase. I should finish, I guess, or I have one minute more? One minute more. One minute. OK, just a short case study. That we did 154 uh, assessments of bridges in the last 15 years. First, we started with initial assessments, so with the available data. And then only in the second stage, we performed advanced assessment with the measurements that I've just described. And the results are quite important to understand what is going on. From those 154, 118 were already proven safe, safe for existing traffic conditions after initial assessment, and additional 23 uh, when we performed the measurements that I've just described. Only 13 of them required severe actions, like posting, strengthening, and replacement. This basically means around 10 times saving in rehabilitation costs, and which is even more important, uh, you should be aware, I'm sure you are aware, that indirect costs would typically be at least twice, if not three, four times higher than the direct cost. So conclusions is basically repetition, so if we have to save time, I will say thank you. Thank you very much.